Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another ICB TV. Uh, got a good number of you on today, and probably because we've got uh, Ian Holloway with us. Now, some of you who were at um, Summit last year will know Ian. He had a very good rating after his presentation. Of course, we brought him in today to talk to you about the latest situation. He is the payroll expert. He's the guru. He's actually head of uh, legislation and compliance at an organization called Sintra. And he's just been saying whilst we're off air that it's probably the last thing you want to be when these things are happening. Legislation and compliance, it's all up in the air. And he's got so many questions backwards and forwards. No, how are you feeling? So well, mm -hmm. welcome in. How are you? Are you okay? Yeah, good, good. Thank you. Yes, good. Good. Well, thank you for coming on. I know there are a lot of calls on your time at the moment, but I know you appreciate how important bookkeepers are and the job mm, that they absolutely. do. Absolutely. So um, I know you've got a presentation. I think the best thing to do is get you straight up online. Let's go through your presentation. And then uh, those of you who want to ask questions, I know some have already sent in questions, but Ian will be hanging around afterwards to take some questions. And I've got some that are, uh, believe it or not, non-payroll. But uh, Ian, I'll hand over to you. Okay, terrific. Let, my sh let me share my screen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for... Um, for coming to this um, uh, um, uh, ICB TV. I think it's really great that um, we're doing this on this subject of furloughing. So it's furloughing employees and putting them on furloughed leave. And what I was saying to Gary just beforehand, in my position at um, Sintra, HR and Payroll Services, it's frustrating because I like to look at the legislation that's out there and how... Uh, we as a company and, and we as the profession can comply with it. Well, we haven't got any legislation on this at the moment and the chances of legislation come in, maybe it will come later on this month. Maybe it will come later on this month. But by the time it does come and by the time it gets through the, the Houses of Parliament, employers will have already been um, 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 using HMRC's guidance. So let's have a look. And so that's what I'm having to do at the moment. I'm having to look and interpret HMRC's guidance along with a lot of my other professional colleagues in the uh, profession. Now, why isn't that? All right, okay. So let's look at what agenda I've got um, for this afternoon, because really what I want to do is I want to give you as much guidance as possible. I want you to uh, give, uh, give you some points, perhaps that you can take back to your workplaces. And I'm going to be talking all of the time about this guidance that um, resulted from the announcement from Rishi Sunak, who's the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom. So I want to talk about the, the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme or the CJRS, you might see it as the JRS, and the, the basic concept of that um, job retention scheme, which is an admirable, admirable one. Then I want to talk about how it affects employers and particularly how it affects payroll, what we can be doing, what we should be doing, what we might have to do in the future. And then importantly for employers, now I don't know how much of an implication this is going to be for payroll departments, for payroll agents and bookkeepers, recovering those monies in the form of a grant from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Now I'm sure that you'll have seen a lot of what I'm going to talk about on the likes of the BBC and Sky and read it in the Daily Mail and the Sun and, and heard on other presentations. So this is my interpretation of that. And firstly, I would say, I'm not Mystic Meg. I really cannot guess what the legislation is actually going to say. I can interpret the guidance, but I cannot forecast what the legislation is actually going to say. I hope to goodness that the legislation when it comes out is not totally different from the guidance that employers should be using and working with right now because there's employers up and down the land furloughing their employees. At the company I'm currently working for, we furloughed employees at the end of March and we're having to work with the guidance that, that we've got because there isn't any legislation. So I think the, the, the most immediate action I'm telling everybody in every, you know, when I, when I, in everybody that I meet, I'm saying that the first thing that you should be doing is looking at HMRC's guidance dated the 26th of March, taking a copy of it, going to bed with it, having it tattooed. You should really 
embed that in your mind, that guidance. So save it as a PDF, print it, and if it turns out in a month's time that there's other guidance or that guidance changes and you ever have to defend yourself, uh, well, why did you do this? Because that's not what the guidance says. You can say, well, we acted upon the guidance as at the 26th of March. And that's what I'm doing. That's what many, many employers are doing up and down the land. So to put yourself in a defensive position, take a copy of that guidance, save it as a PDF, dated the 26th of March before it changes because it hasn't been unknown for civil servants perhaps to make tweaks to guidance silently they call it so that's my first um, action point if you like take a copy of that guidance dated the 26th of March so let's just have a look at this uh, 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 retention scheme. A temporary scheme, this is what Rish Rishi Sunak said, temporary scheme running for three months, but he said he would extend it if necessary. So for the three months from the 1st of May, to the, uh, 1st of March to the 31st of May. And the reason for it is essentially to retain employees that would other have, otherwise have been made redundant or laid off and at the same time as retaining employees supporting the employers that are retaining those employees so as i said before it's really admirable the intentions of this scheme it really is admirable with regards to supporting employers i'm sure that you're aware of the headline the um, the headlines that employers can recover 80 percent of uh, of an employee's salary um, capped at £2,500. So you've got employers up and down the land putting employees on furloughed leave and reducing their salary by 20%, i.e. to the 80% that they can actually recover from the government in the form of a grant. But on top of that grant, employers can also recover the national insurance contributions on the salary that they're paying caps at two and a half thousand pounds and then they can recover employer pension contributions now regardless of what kind of pension scheme the employer is operating what this grant from hmrc will allow is the recovery of pension contributions as if the the employer was operating a minimum auto enroll a minimum contributions auto enrollment scheme so that's the one that operates on band earnings. So the employer pays between the, the lower band and the upper band, the lower band being aligned with the lower earnings limit. And the contribution percentage is 3%. And I know a lot of our clients are saying, well, that's not how our pension scheme operates. Well, unfortunately, that's that those minimum contributions as if it were an AE scheme, an auto enrollment scheme, are all that the government's going to reimburse under the CJRS. With regards to retaining employees, it's really important that employees and employers realize that this is a contractual change. It's an employment law consideration. You can't just tell an employee, you are gonna become a furloughed employee. You're, you're an employee today, tomorrow you're gonna to be a furloughed employee. The employee actually has to agree to that. You cannot say to them, I'm gonna reduce your salary from this amount of money to this amount of money, unless the employee agrees. Now, I think in today's Today's environment, the larger number of employees would agree to having a contractual change made because the probability is the alternative is that they're laid off and possibly made redundant. Importantly, under the CJRS, what the guidance of the 26th of March tells us that if an employee has a contractual change and is moved to being a furloughed employee, they keep all of their current employment rights. So they continue to accrue holiday pay and they continue to accrue the right to sickness pay, the right to maternity leave, adoption, um, uh, the right to request flexible working, all of their employment rights terms and conditions are maintained during a period of furloughed leave, furloughed leave just as if they were working under their contract of employment. So that's really important for um, uh, HR departments probably to realise. And as I've said before, the whole idea of the CJRS is to prevent or delay um, layoffs from the workplace, which potentially might lead to redundancies. The first thing that I really want to talk about is, is this universal credit, which has hit the headlines, I know, just this week with nearly a million new claimants for the universal credit. 
And there's very little that the payroll department, employers and agents can do to um, influence how the universal credit works, mm -hmm. apart from making sure that we pay the right amount of money and we send it to HMRC on time. But one thing that we can do for this increasing number of people that are going to be claiming this, this benefit, this, this welfare benefit, is we can recognize what the payday is and what the payment date is. And I know that when I spoke at the summit in um, uh, 2019, this came as a surprise to a number of people, which is why I'm repeating it um, here to a, to a larger audience. <clears throat> so you've got these two fields. Uh, 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 two dates, the payment date and the payday. The payday, uh, the payment date, I'm sorry, the payment date is a field that is declared um, in the, on, on the full payment submission and that goes to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. So in your payroll system, you'll input a payment date, it's declared on the FPS, that goes to HMRC, who in turn pass that to the, the, to the Department of Work and Pensions, who monitor someone's entitlement or non-entitlement to the universal credit. Payday doesn't go on the FPS. The payment date is defined as the date that someone's contractually entitled to receive their wages on a weekly or a monthly basis. So they're paid on the 30th of the month, they're paid on the 20th, the 25th of the month. It says in their contract of employment, you will be paid on the 25th of the month. And that is the payment date. The payday is the date that someone actually physically receives the money, their net pay into their bank account possibly buy backs, maybe they get a check, something, something like that. Now, quite often in the week or in the month, the payment date and the payday will absolutely be the same. You're entitled to be paid on the 25th, we've paid you on the 25th. But if the 25th falls on a Saturday, it's quite likely that the employer will bring the payday forward to the 24th, to the uh, day before. So in that instance, the payment date that is declared on the FPS must be the 25th, but the payday must be the 24th. Um, otherwise, there's all sorts of contractual um, um, irritations there if you don't pay somebody on time. The in real importance of the payment date, the one thing that employers can do to help HMRC pass the right information to, to the Department of Work and Pensions to regulate someone's entitlement or non-entitlement to the universal credit is to get the payment date right. Because as I've said there on the slide, it helps regulate a stable universal credit assessment period between this date and this date. So that's where the payment date has got to be stable. The importance of the payday for payroll professionals is that the full payment submission, the RTI submission, the, uh, the full payment submission, must be sent to Her Majesty's Re Revenue and Customs on or before 12 o'clock on the day that someone is paid. That's what the legislation says. So that's my little lecture about payment date is not the same as payday. Now, often people will come to me and they'll say, oh, my payroll software only allows me to put in one date. It only allows me to put in the payday. And my stock reply to that is, well, you've got to go back to your software developer and say, well, I need another field because payday is not necessarily the same as payment date. And the software developer is going to have to, uh, to make the change. Uh, unfortunately, it's been around since 2013, this payment date, so they should recognize it. OK, let's move on then to um, what, what else I want to talk about. And I want to remind you mentally to take action that the concept of the, and, and the intentions of this admirable scheme are to help employees, help and re retain employees on the payroll, in employment, and at the same time for the employers that do this um, retaining the employees, they will get a government grant paid directly to them from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Now, all we can do at the moment is interpret the guidance that's out there. The guidance from HMRC dated the 26th of March, 2020. And I'm, I'm separating it into three parts. Retaining the employee is the first thing that I want to talk about. Second thing is payroll obligations or payroll implications of the CJRS. 
and I will come back to all of those. I let's flick in through it, but I will come back to those. And the third thing that I've broken it down to is what employers are going to really be concerned about is if they're putting all of these employees on unpaid leave or, or uh, leave where they're not actually performing any work under their contract of employment, well, that's really good of them, and it prevents possibly employees going to claim universal credit or being made redundant, but the employers are going to, go, going to want to get this money back via a grant from HMRC. So that's what I want to talk about as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is the processes that possibly won't be payroll, but definitely will be employer, and payroll people should know about this. And it's keeping the employee on the payroll, preventing them um, possibly being laid off or um, even worse, being made redundant. And it's ever so important to realize that this is a contract change. You cannot just change somebody from being an employee on a Wednesday to a furloughed employee on a Thursday. The, it's all by mutual agreement. So employment law hasn't gone under the carpet just because of this introduction of furloughing, which is a term that we never really were familiar with or until about um, a week or so ago. <clears throat> Another thing that's important to realize is that all employees can be furloughed. However, not all furloughed employees are liable for the reclaim um, from um, HMRC in the form of a grant. Employers can only make a reclaim for employees that they furloughed if the employee was on the payroll on the 28th of April 2020. Now, the very first thing, and I've had a couple of questions through from ICB members, the very first thing that I would say is when an employer is making the decision of which employees to furlough, they've got to be very, very careful about this for fear of discrimination and equality legislation, and employment legislation and protections. I had yeah. a query from um, um, a, a client the other day, and they said, we're, we're thinking about making somebody, com someone's coming back from redundancy, we want to make them redundant, uh, we want to furlough them immediately, not have them come back, because um, they wouldn't really fit in well, um, you know, with all, all this working from home. And I said, be very, very careful. Women on maternity leave, pregnant women, breastfeeding, returning from maternity, have got far many more protections than a lot of other employees. So be careful, employers, who you're selecting to go on furlough. Be fair. Ian, can I just interrupt you there for a second? Yes. Um, I know your slide says the 28th of February. I believe that in your presentation, Jess, you accidentally said the 28th of April. Now, Did I? Some of our, yeah, I think so. Uh, so I? as some of our members aren't looking at this, they're, they're listening to it through earphones while they're working, just, just so that they, they get themselves back down off the ceiling. It is definitely the 28th of February. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely the 28th of February. So all employees can be furloughed. Starters on or before the 28th of February are absolutely okay, according to my interpretation, even if they weren't paid in February, they were paid for the first time in March. As long as the contract of employment said, you know, you are employed from the 27th of February, the 26th of February, something like that. That's absolutely fine. Now, you can't have employers going away and sort of like manipulating contracts because there's, there's going to be some compliance activity, I'm sure, at some point. But starters on or before the 28th of February, but not paid until March, that's absolutely fine. But not anybody that's starting after the 29th of February. So be careful about this manipulation of contracts. And I've heard that horror story as well. What the guidance says is that employees are unpaid on unpaid leave before the 28th of February, or on or before the 28th of February, can't be furloughed either. Well, that's strictly incorrect. They can be furloughed. It's just that those employees, whatever the employer pays, won't be able to claim their money back in the form of a grant from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. So employees on unpaid leave after the 28th of February, absolutely fine. They can get a grant. We can get a grant back from HMRC. And very important, absolutely essential, that furloughed employees do not do any work under their contract of employment. 
they can volunteer, they can come into work, they can do a bit of cleaning or, 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 or whatever, keep the place going, but they must do nothing that provides any services or generates any revenue for the organization that is later gonna be claiming this grant from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. So that's really important as well. Volunteering, yes, absolutely fine, but nothing that provides essential services or generates any revenue for the organization. And there's been a lot of query about this um, second jobs. You know, well, if, if I'm a furloughed employee, I can't have another job. That's just, that's just wrong. If, you, if you're furloughed in one employment, it doesn't mean that you can't work for another employer. So for example, if I'm furloughed at uh, Sintra, for example, it doesn't mean that I can't stop uh, stacking shelves at Tesco or working in the Rose and Crown. Well, probably the Rose and Crown is, is closed, but uh, a, a, a second job is absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. It's, it's acceptable now with employment and it's acceptable and it can mix employment and furloughed employment. That's really important to remember. Employment law, equality law has not changed just because of this introduction of this new terminology into the payroll lexicon, furloughing. Employment law is still there. So keep that in your mind. I've looked at retaining the employee, why it's important. I'm going to come back to this, paying and the payroll implications. I could have got this a bit quicker on my animations. What I want to look at now is the end of the process. So once the employer has retained and paid the employee, how are they gonna get the money back from HMRC, which Rishi, Rishi Sunak has said will happen? Well, I'm gonna cover that reasonably quickly because HMRC have not given any information at all. They said there's going to be an online portal that's going to be available mid to late April 2020. I did hear the 21st of April. I don't know where I heard that from and I, and I don't necessarily rely on that. But the fact that employers are not going to be able to reclaim the monies that they paid in April until late April means that employers are, are definitely going to have to consider their bank balances and, and their cash flows. They're going to be paying out, especially weekly, fortnightly payrolls. They're going to be paying out before they can actually make a claim for money to come back from HMRC. And that's where this um, coronavirus business interruption loan comes into place. So you might want to Google that, look on gov.uk. If employers are just not in a position to pay it, their, their furloughed employees, they can get money in the form of this loan, this business interruption loan, to enable them to pay their employees. I'm absolutely sure that the legislation, when it comes out, will, will have some audit um, um, uh, uh, and compliance processes in it processes it. I'd be very, very surprised if it didn't. It will give HMRC the power to um, edit or uh, to audit records at a later stage. Absolutely sure. Then it comes down to who's actually going to be making the reclaim. Is the employer themselves going to be doing that? Or what about the employer that's outsourced their payroll function? Will they expect the bookkeeper to do it or their agent to do it, their tax advisor to do it? I think that's something that's got to be decided on. Who is gonna be the contact? This is information that's gonna be provided to HMRC. Who is the contact, the main contact? Is it the employer? Is it the bookkeeper? Is it the payroll professional at a, a, an outsourced uh, firm of um, uh, payroll providers? the telephone number, the contact telephone number, PAY reference number for the scheme on which the, the furloughed employees are being paid, and the bank details, because HMRC need the bank details, so when you submit all of this information to them and you give a total value, they will say, okay, we'll give you that money back, and they'll only pay into a UK bank and you give them a sort code and an account number. And I understand that it's gonna be quite swift, um, the repayment. So the action that I'm recommending at the moment is that there's a lot of information that we don't know, but some of the preparatory work can be done now. Who is the contact? Who's gonna do it? And it's very difficult, I think, for outsourced payroll providers, for bookkeepers, for agents, because I mean, employers are undoubtedly gonna say, well, you do our payroll for us, um, you do it. And, 
that is that a position that we actually want to be in? I'm not going to be recommending that to the company that I'm currently working for, um, to be quite honest. Um, no, I'm not. So that's a, a decision that's going to be, uh, have to, uh, uh, you're going to have to come to a decision between your clients and uh, the, the pr provider. Carrying on with reclaiming from, uh, from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in terms of a grant, you're going to have to detail the total number of employees that you have furloughed. Therefore, at some point when this reclaim portal is open, how are you going to actually get, be able to pull that information out of the payroll? Bearing in mind that not all employers will furlough all employees at the company I'm working for. We've got some furloughed employees, some that are employees performing work under our con contracts of employment. There's some furloughed who are not performing work. So how is our company going to be able to identify the salary that was paid to these furloughed employees? So I'm suggesting that employers possibly might want to set up new pay elements. So you have a salary or a wage to your employees, but a furloughed salary or a furloughed wage to your furloughed employees. Maybe put them into a new cost set center, something like that. The employer has then got to calculate the reclaim value and they've also got to bear in mind that the minimum amount of furloughed leave is three weeks. So you can furlough an employee for a week. However, unless they've been furloughed for a minimum of three weeks, you can't make any reclaim under this grant. And I think when this is operational, mid end of uh, end of april employers are going to be experiencing cash flow issues and they are going to be wanting to make claims every three weeks for what's happened in the past and you can also make claims for what's going to happen in the future as well so prospective um, uh, uh, wage costs now how are agents how are payroll bureaus how are bookkeepers going to facilitate that provision of information to the employer if they're going to be doing it through the portal. I've said that before, um, you'll get the money back via BACS. Now, once the money comes back via BACS, it's got to go into the company account some, somehow. So how is the, how, how are the books going to be actually reconciled? You've got a lot of money going out with wages, tax, national insurance, all that kind of thing. And then you suddenly got this money coming in. How is that going to be reconciled? So that's something I think that needs to be thought of. And who is going to do it? The employer or the agent? All along the way, I really honestly believe that there will be compliance activity somewhere. HMRC will want to look at because it's going to be billions of pounds that the government is paying out, paying out here. They don't want to pay it out unnecessarily. So all along the way, every action you take has got to be justified and double justified and double justified. You need to write down everything that you're doing. This is the reason I did it. This is the reason that we chose to, to furlough these employees as opposed to these employees. This is what we did with the money. This is how we can justify how we've um, put through a reclaim value to HMRC. Just put yourself in a defensive position. It's not a pleasant position to be in, and we don't often have to do it, but we should increasingly be doing it, and definitely for the job retention scheme. So I've done one, the purpose of the scheme, retaining the employee to save them being made redundant, and I've focused on the contract, because it is a contract thing, and I've had some, some, some clients come to me and said, what about if the employee refuses? Well, I think they'd be silly to refuse, but it's up to them. If they don't want to agree a contract change, that's absolutely fine. So that's an employment law thing. Then I've gone through the end process, which is getting the money back from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in the form of a grant sometime mid to end April. And there's some considerations there. Now what I want to look at is the things that affect us day to day. Um, once the employer has said, these are the furloughed employees, now go pay them. And essentially, that is the most important thing, identifying the employees and identifying the pay that you're going to pay them. Paying the, the, um, the furloughed employee, the furloughed wages, is nothing different from what we do now. We enter the value 
and we calculate tax and we calculate national insurance and now comes the net pay and we pay the net pay to the employee or we send that information back to the employer for them to pay the net pay we we um, uh, declare all of that information to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs via real-time information that hasn't changed calculating payroll hasn't changed remitting the monies to HMRC hasn't changed it still has to be done by the 19th of the month I think possibly the emphasis, there's more emphasis on getting the pay right because there's a lot of employees who will be out there um, very much reliant on this, this pay now. Not that we ever um, didn't get it right in the first place. So getting the pay right, declaring on time and accurately to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, given that a lot of these furloughed employees will be suffering a drop, drop in income, and maybe we'll be making a claim under universal credit. Well, if we get the information with the right pay day, uh, payment date on the FPS, HMRC have the right information to pass to the DWP who will monitor someone's entitlement or non-entitlement to the universal credit. Um, monies to HMRC as well. A lot of this is money that we're taking off of employees, the national insurance, the income tax, we're taking off. So it's not employer's money, it's the employee's money, and we're withholding them to, to later pay it over. It's the national insurance that there might be a bit of a, a lag, a lag with, because um, I recognize that that's an employer cost. But there hasn't been anything, as far as I'm aware, unless it's in the last few minutes, for HMRC relaxing the payment dates of the 19th of the month or the 22nd if we're paying electronically. But I understand if employers are gonna be in a bit of hardship there, but that's what this business interruption loan is all about. So, as I said, I don't wanna talk about those things that we do as normal, I want to talk about pay. And that's the thing that I'm getting most queries on and it just um, keeps me awake at night. Now, I do not know the answers to everything I'm interpreting, my colleagues are interpreting, we're writing frequently asked questions, I'm more than happy to contribute to frequently asked questions um, with the, the ICB if I know the answer. I will talk about it to anybody because it's so important that we get this right for the employee's point of view and for the employer's point of view. So if I don't cover something, don't blame me because it's Possibly, I don't know the answer. I need to go and research it. I need to go and talk to people. I don't know everything. But the concepts of it are that an employee will be paid 80% of their regular wage or two and a half thousand pounds. So 80% of their salary, if you call it a salary, 80% of their salary capped at two and a half thousand pounds. Why did they pick two and a half thousand pounds? Because apparently that's the median UK, uh, it's the median average UK salary. So they will receive 80% of what they got before, capped at two and a half thousand pounds. But that regular wage will exclude any part of the wage that's made up of fees, commission, or bonuses. Now, this is just. Um, uh, 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 crazy guidance, uh, to be quite honest. Um, fees, I'm aware a lot of the time that um, employers are paying employees what they're terming as fees, but in actual fact, it's no different from remuneration. So we need to look at the terminology. Is the fee actually an employee's regular wage? Is that what they're just calling it? Um, commission as well. Um, the, the, the reason for putting that on there is um, that commission is something that's paid frequently on top of a regular wage. So we'll pay you a wage, but if you do it by, by Wednesday rather than Thursday, we'll give you 5% commission. So the reason for sort of like saying not commission is because um, that's on top of a regular wage. But there are a lot of occupations out there that rely on just commission as their regular wage. Salespeople, hairdressers, that kind of thing, they would totally rely on commission. So that's a little bit dubious as well. Bonuses, I think, is relatively clear cut. A bonus is on something on top of the regular wage. But if it's a contractual bonus, 
I would have said that that's a different thing. I would have thought, well, if it's a contractual bonus that I will always get a hundred pounds at Christmas, well, I've got an expectation that I'll always get a hundred pounds at Christmas, so I'll live my life and um, uh, buy my house and and uh, mow my garden in accordance with the fact that I'm always going to get a bonus at, at Christmas. So, little bit um, uh, worried about bonuses, but. Gen the general thing about a bonus is it's performance related. If it's performance related, no. If it's contractual, I would question that, to be quite honest. With regards to the other pay elements, now I've been speaking to colleagues about this, and I said, well, what's your, what's your interpretation of things like overtime? Because we, we haven't just got um, uh, uh, just, just overtime, we've got regular overtime, um, uh, contractual overtime, voluntary overtime, irregular overtime, we've got uh, tips uh, and all that kind of thing. What are you making of these? Should they be included? Because if I work in a restaurant, I'm probably on a low wage and I'm relying on my tips that come from a trunk. Um, what about those? Should they be part of my regular wage? And a number of people of us, uh, people have, have got together and they've convinced me that in actual fact, if it isn't specifically excluded in the 26th of March 2020 guidance, then the inference is it can be included. The only things that were excluded were fees, commission and bonuses, and they need to be looked at when you, when you pay those. That's why I'm saying take a copy of that guidance 26th of March 2020, take it, and then you can always say, well, the reason that I included overtime was because it wasn't excluded in your guidance that came out, and I had to make a decision because I had to pay my employees in April. Um, some of the queries that I've got, what I'll do is, I'll try, if I've got time, I'll try and go through, through them at the end, but that's the, the, um, the, the, the way that I'm working at the moment. If it isn't specifically excluded in the guidance, it can be included. And there are so many different elements, car allowances and that kind of thing. I've seen a number of things on, on LinkedIn because um, a company car has to be provided because that's under the, the terms and conditions of employment, continuing employment. So they thought, well, why wouldn't a car allowance continue? But there are some employers that choose to stop car allowance. But I think if it isn't specifically excluded, it can be included in this regular wage as long as the cap is not two and a half thousand pounds. Of course, you can pay more. Of course, you can. The, the employer can pay more, but the grant from HMRC will be capped at two and a half thousand plus national insurance plus pension. Mm. And I think what the employer needs to get into their head, bearing in mind that the reclaim is going to be later, is that in the government's mind, in their employee's mind. Pay is the most important thing. Pay them before you reclaim it. That's so if you try and sort of like, it's not the most important thing to employers. Employers actually want the money before they, get, before they pay. But reverse it, think on your head. Pay is the most important thing for these furloughed employees. It's most important that they have their, their pay. So they can pay their mortgages, they can pay their gas, their electric, and they can feed their, feed their children and all that kind of thing. It's, reclaiming is almost secondary to pay. Pay is um, most important. I've talked about the on costs before. Employer mix on that regular wage or the cap. Employer pension contributions. I've talked about that as if the scheme were a national uh, were a, uh, an auto enrollment minimum contributions scheme. And I appreciate that there are probably more employers out there not using one of those schemes than there are using one of those schemes. The company I'm working for, we've got a number of uh, sch uh, uh, schemes that just have uh, five percent, ten percent of salary, something like that, or they don't use the minimum contribution scheme. Um, under the Pensions Act or the Northern Ireland equivalent, they use um, uh, certification schemes. So set one, set two, set three. Well, as regards reclaiming money from HMRC, unfortunately, what the, the actual pension costs that are incurred are re disregarded. The pension costs that be, can be reclaimed from HMRC are the pension costs as if the employer was operating this minimum contribution scheme. That's going to be a tricky one, I think, for employers. And that's what I've just said there. How are you going to, how are you going to explain this to employers? An employer is spending out a lot of money in pension contributions, but only can claim back a certain amount. That's going to be a tricky one. The employers, agents, bookkeepers, and payroll professionals are going to have to um, explain to employers. 
just a few more slides if I, if I could. I want to talk about the maximum reclaim amount. Obviously in regards to the salary or regular wage or wage cost, look at the guidance, it's referred to in a number of different ways, salary, wage cost, regular wage, employment cost, it used to say, um, two and a half thousand pounds, capped at two and a half thousand pounds. It doesn't mean you have to pay everybody two and a half thousand pounds, you pay them a thousand pounds. But if you pay them two and a half thousand pounds, you can get it back. If you pay three thousand pounds, you can only get two and a half thousand pounds back. The employer, national insurance contributions, on their category letter on two and a half thousand pounds, which for 2019-20 comes out at 245 spot 78. And the employer minimum pension contributions, that's 3% above the lower earnings limit on two and a half thousand pounds, 59 spot 64. So the total maximum reclaim for 2019-20, 2805 spot 42. You can reclaim less, absolutely fine. But for employers that pay more than two and a half thousand pounds, they've got to recognize that the maximum amount that they can reclaim, the maximum grant per employee that they're going to get is £2,805.42. And of course, for 2020-21, which is just a few days away, that amount is going to go down slightly because the lower earnings limit has gone, oh, the secondary threshold has gone up, the lower earnings limit has gone up as well. So uh, the pension contribution will be slightly less, the NICs will be slightly less. So that amount, the total reclaim amount for 2020-21 will go down slightly, but that's the situation at the moment. So just as a quick example of how this will work in practice, the employer and the employee agree that uh, rather than paying their regular wage, they will be paid £800, which must be at least 80% of their regular wage. And that's only in HMRC guidance at the moment. I'm absolutely sure that will be defined in legislation, but that legislation will come way after we've got to action this. The reclaim is the employer NICS on £800, which is that at the moment in 2019-20. The minimum pension contributions, as if it was a 3% scheme, on £800, £8.64. Add all that together for that employee, the employer is allowed to claim 819 spot 82. And that portal will be open towards the end of April 2020. Hopefully, I've done it all. And hopefully, you'll have gained something from that. And I wish that I could be definitive and provide the answers. However, I'm working from a 1A4 sheet of HMRC guidance, which you need to have tattooed on you on the weekend. You need to sleep with it. You need to file it. You need to save it and back it up. You need, if you're going to be relying on that to pay April wages, you need to be saving that. In summary then, I'm nearly finished, Gary. Get that guidance. No, good. You keep going. You go. Fine. Get the guidance. Honestly, I've got it saved in so many places. I think my current partner's even got a copy of it here. Um, uh, and we've, we've got it out with a sheet. Um, so save it. It's absolutely paramount if you're going to be acting on that. Remember what the scheme is all about. It's retaining employees. So it's a different mindset. It's retaining employees so the employer doesn't have to make them redundant. And the employee doesn't have to make redundant, be made redundant. Pay first, money later. Employment and equality law considerations have not, they, they stay the same. Think about these, these um, maternity cases. Um, if they've been selected for furloughing as opposed to another employee, step back a second and say, oh, hold on a second, they've got special protections under employment law. Watch for reclaim guidance. Um, apparently, HMRC is saying they're working 24 hours a day, apparently. But I believe that there's some work that can be done now. I believe that you need to <clears> sort <throat> out these preliminary, well, who's going to be doing it? Are you going to do it? Am I going to do it? How are we going to do it? How are we going to collate the information? That kind of thing. What's your telephone number? What's the PAYE reference number? How are you going to be separating these pay, uh, furloughed pay elements in your payroll system? If your whole payroll isn't furloughed, if you've got some employees and some furloughed employees, surely you're going to want to, to, to be able to push a button for some report at some time. It makes sense to me to have salary and furloughed salary or a separate cost center, something like that. You've got to be able to identify these people. 
remember, I keep saying it, pay is the most important thing. I feel like I'm working for the government. And we need to watch for further guidance regarding the reclaim of national insurance and the reclaim of pension. Now that guidance on the 26th of March 2020 said, HMRC will issue further guidance in respect of national insurance and pension. The reason that they're gonna issue further guidance is because at the time that guidance came out, they didn't actually know how to do it. Um, so I wonder what that further guidance is gonna say. I, I really do. So for paying, I would say rely on that guidance of the 26th of March 2020. Justify, 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 like I've said there. When it comes to reclaiming, look for this additional guidance because that additional guidance, as well as the further guidance for national insurance and pension, might actually simplify the way that we calculate national insurance and pension. Maybe, I don't, I don't know, but just watch out for those things and I shall be watching them out, out for them as well. Um, I can hardly sleep waiting for guidance. Well, I'm glad you're awake for us today, Ian. It was fantastic. That's, that's been a great help. Um, as you said, you are living, eating and breathing the whole thing at the moment. Uh, we thank you very much for your guidance. And uh, I hope that uh, we can, you can field a few questions for us. I'm sure Amy will have some questions together, some of them previously. However, before we do that, something you covered and something I'd, I'd like to reiterate to our members is you need to stick to the rules. Do not let your client persuade you that they need the cash. So can they do some sort of uh, holding exercise or fiddling exercise or anything else? Um, yeah. As Ian has said, there is going to be one huge audit of what's gone on once this is all through. The will, government yeah. doesn't give away money easily. And, um, you know, don't forget, you're not just a bookkeeper, you're an ICB bookkeeper. You have a reputation for you and for us that we've got to be very careful. And actually, we've had a lot of our members saying, do I have the authority to say no to my client because he's asking for this or she's asking for that? And the answer is, yes, you damn well do. You are the bookkeeper, you're in charge and you tell them no. And if you find that they have another advisor, a tax advisor or accountant that's saying, um, no, I think we can do this. Uh, then you need to make some form of report through and, and talk to us first. But, uh, you know, that needs to go on to, to some sort of uh, report and we'll help you with that because it, the government is giving away billions and, you know, that uh, apparently they're, they're even thinking about giving away some more, but we can't have people bending the system. Anyway, sorry, Amy, what have we got? Well, as per normal, it's been very busy on the Q&A. So let me see if uh, we can, what we should tackle first. Um, some very interesting questions again. Um, lots of positive response to your presentation, Ian, so don't worry too much. Um, I think this might be a sort of relatively quick one. Um, if somebody is self, there were questions about shielding and self-isolating and if you're doing it not because you need to shield yourself or you're sick but if you're doing it because you live with somebody who's in that situation there's a bit of confusion about who can claim statutory sick pay um, and then who should claim um, the statutory guarantee pay and who can be furloughed if you are shielding in accordance with government guidelines you can claim you can be furloughed or you can claim ssp or the employer can pay you ssp but why would you go for ssp when furloughed salary is probably going to be much better and the employer can get that get that back if you're actually uh withdrawing your labor and you think well actually i'm too scared to go to the workplace or, or i think i ought to take a uh, look after my parents you are actually sort of like saying to your employer i'm not going to work you're really going absent without without any sort of leave at all and i would think the employer has got a right to say we're not going to pay you anything that was tough good great um so if um so okay um so questions about directors and furlough. Actually, we haven't had that many of these. Um, if a director is still trying to tender for contracts, presumably he can't furlough himself. No, yep. no. No, no. And I saw something actually today um, issued by the, is it the Institute for Directors, saying directors, no. if they're furloughed, um, uh, whilst they're being furloughed, got to be really careful about using things like Twitter. 
and Facebook. You know, and that's a consideration because that could be generating um, revenue Business. for the future. Yeah. Not now, but for the future. Got to be really careful of Facebook, Twitter, and all that kind of thing. If you're furloughed, just go and sit in the garden. Wow, that's that's something we haven't thought about. Okay, well that's good. Yeah, yeah I haven't thought about it. Open for business, yeah. Amy, we've lost you. You're on. That's it. Here I am, I'm back. Um, and just, you know, sort of wanting clarity on at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any solution for people who've paid themselves the minimum salary and topped up, um, given themselves everything else as a dividend. Tough. Nothing you can do about that. No, no, no. I think quite a lot of this is just, you know, sort of, can you just, re like, just so I can go back and tell my client the, the truth. Um, Lovely. Okay, so people who, um, also this is another one, Jason has asked, um, I've got a couple of employees who started working on March the 1st. Um, it's unfortunate. Nothing we can do. No. Barry Peake asked an interesting one. He says somebody was employed um, previously, but they actually weren't paid. Um, so therefore they weren't on the, the payroll as of February. Can they be included? Yes, I, I think that HM, one of HMRC's compliance activities is going to be, um, uh, because eventually they're going to have to have a breakdown of, of all the employees, and eventually HMRC will get around to it, and they will say, well, you're claiming this grant for this person, but according to our records, you didn't submit a full payment submission in February for this person. So the employer has got to be in a position then to say, ah, oh, no, well, they started too late. I'd already done the payroll. They did actually start then, but I paid them in March. Or, oh God, now I forgot about them. As long as, as long as there's something at the office which says contractually they did start at some time in February before the 1st of March, that's absolutely fine. So I would be prepared for those people. But if they started before, actually really, really, truly started before the 1st of March, they're absolutely fine, even if they weren't paid until March payroll. I think where we've had a problem with that, uh, Ian, just to let you know, a couple of people have decided that uh, their uh, clients have said, I've now taken on my wife and four children, um, and I, they were working for me. Of course they were, but I forgot to mention it to you, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think it's down to the judgment of our members to decide whether it looks like a fiddle, because I think if it looks like a fiddle, it normally is. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got to be able to sit off as an inspector and justify why you agreed to that decision being made. Absolutely being right. Very tricky position for payroll professionals, for people, for people like us, for, for, for companies like, like I am. We, we essentially do what the client tells us to do. However, we've, we have got an obligation really professionally and for the payroll profession to actually go back and query things. However, if, if at the end of the day they say, well, actually, I'm paying you a fortune for, us, for you to do the payroll, We've got no alternative, but as long as we put, we defend ourselves and we put something down in writing that this doesn't look right, different for, for organisations like yours, where I think there's some reporting that has to be done, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. So some of the questions I think sound quite juicy um, are around this sort of part month, when you've been furloughed for part of the month, because obviously well, I suppose we're through March now, aren't we? Um, but if you've run the payroll and everyone's been paid, but some of those employees uh, had to stop working as of like the 20, 20th of March, um, presumably you can then, you can claim for that as a part payment? Absolutely, you can, have, you can be part of the month employee, part of the month furloughed employee. The problem, and, and we're running, we're rerunning loads of March payrolls um, we're, we're with that, putting new people, people on, but the problem with that, when you look at your March payroll, how are you going to be able to identify the salary costs for the part of the month where they were an employee and the part of the month they were an, a furloughed employee? That's why I'm saying, you know, if you're going to rerun payrolls or do whatever, Keeps, or keeps a manual records or something, a furloughed pay element seems to be quite good. Unless you want to do it by um, Excel. We've got a number of clients that are doing it via Excel. Well, that's fine, unless you're British Airways. I'm sure they wouldn't want to do it on Excel <laughs> for 36,000 people. Yeah. Or Primark. Primark are not doing it on Excel either. Um, okay, fantastic. So, so that's fine. Okay, and if you're... Um, if you're week, if you're paid weekly, and you get furloughed part way through a week, 
do you apportion the NIM pension contributions that you then reclaim from HMRC? Asks Lisa. Obviously a very good question. Can I pass? <laughs> you can pass, as long as you answer it later. Add it, yeah, add it to the log, because that's, that's, in, that's interesting. Um, I, 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 I truly don't know. I truly don't know. And I'm going to have to think about it. Fantastic. Top points, Lisa. Well done there. Um, <laughs> Valerie, Haig and Claire um, wonder about, again, about weekly pay, payroll. Um, there's apparently nine employees to furlough. They all earn above the 2,500 cap. Um, they've asked this. April is a four-week month, but May is a five-week month. Do we spread the 2,500 across the month in which... Uh, across the month, in which case they will get less for the weeks in May, because they're week they're paid weekly. Mm. We're not doing this to try and catch you out here. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. assure you. <laughs> well, the the two thousand five hundred is really important for the grants from HMRC. I mean, you can pay them whatever whatever you like. But I understand that you've got this four four five, haven't you, with the with the weekly payrolls? I understand. Yeah. I understand that. Yes, and you know it's really interesting because there's some queries there that that, that I'm given and you've already sent me. I thought, well, oh, you know, I haven't heard that before. It's really good for me to come on these kind of things because I'm going to get a much broader um, set of queries that when event HMRC do eventually ask, they say, well, what about this? What about that? I don't know the answer to that one either. You put it down on the log. <laughs> Can you, I mean, in the short term, could, can you not average it out over the last 12 months if they've been working that long? Because that will be 445 or whatever. Um, it will give them a slightly higher salary whilst we're thinking about it. If you can justify doing that, and HMRC eventually came and comes and says, well, why did you pay this? And say, well, we believed, in our opinion, this was the best way to give a furloughed employee a regular wage, a wage that they'd normally think that they would be entitled to, I don't see how a court of law, if it ever did get that far, could actually stand up and say, mm. well, the employer didn't do their best. And that's what we, all your employers should be doing. We did our best, mm -hmm. and in our opinion, as long as they're not really flaunting and taking the mickey. <laughs> well, yeah. has anyone ever done that? Um, so variable hours employees, they have been uh, on the system, um, in June, apparently, but they but they didn't earn money in some of the months. So how does it work out? Do you still take that average pay and work it out over twelve months? Over twelve months, you take you take the eleven months of two. This is what the guidance says: you take the eleven months that were paid in two thousand and nineteen twenty, and then that. I suppose you'd only divide. You wouldn't divide that by the eleven months. You'd only divide that by the months in which they got paid, wouldn't you? Um, to come to an average. That's my interpret. That would be my interpretation of it. Yeah, that but would be my interpretation them, of it. Pay them more than look back at the equal. So you'd look back at February two thousand nineteen, and you'd pick the higher. So you do an average for the eleven months of two thousand nineteen twenty, or what they were paid in February two thousand nineteen, and you can claim a grant for whatever is the higher of the two. Ugly, ugly. <sighs> Yeah, so yes. when, when it says you can claim the higher of the, the same month in 2019, is that the same month they're talking about is always February? Or if you f don't furlough until April, do you look at April last year? Always February. Always February. Okay. Always February. And that obviously would stop you then giving yourself, giving somebody a pay rise and claiming more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, great. So actually somebody, has asked, somebody else has asked about pay rises. Claire Rimmer says, good afternoon. Um, if staff are promised a pay rise, were promised a pay rise in the new tax year, um, or indeed the minimum wage increase, is that still allowable? Yeah, you can give it to them. Yeah. But can but, you, uh, but do you still claim on the 80% of February? You still claim on the 80% of the salary that applied on the 28th of February. So it's not going to be included. Uh, my boss was talking to me yesterday about salary increases, and he said, there's no point giving this, is there? And I said, no, I don't want it anyway. <laughs> I think it would very, be very mean-spirited of the employee that was being furloughed to say, I demand my wage rise, because they must be being furloughed for, because the company you know, is, is experiencing difficulty. Let's hope that doesn't happen. 
Yeah, abs absolutely. I, I, I think what we're doing is we're deferring pay increases to when this is all over, which is hopefully not going to be, um, you know, many, many, many months, you know. But unfortunately, yeah, if you start on the 1st of March, you've got a pay rise on the 1st of March. The uh, national minimum wage went up for a first pay reference period on or after the 1st of April. Unfortunately, it's still based on what you were paid in February 2020. Ian, can I ask you one question? It's come up a lot. I'm not sure we've had a definitive answer on it, but um, how is this affected by the minimum wage? So if you're 80%, say you're already on just above minimum wage, your minimum, your 80% puts you below the minimum wage, do you still have to be paid? Do we still claim the yeah. minimum wage as the grant? No. No, that's absolutely fine. You can be paid 80% of the national minimum wage because the national minimum wage is only paid for working time. And whilst you're being furloughed, you're not actually working. So, uh, and, and the but... government guidance on the 26th of March says that, uh, says that. But if the employee does come back from furlough to do some, some online training, to attend a webinar, to refresh themselves and all that kind of thing, that's working time. That's when they've got to be paid the national minimum wage. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Does furloughing employees affect employment allowance? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I made the mistake of asking that question to HMRC. And, um, and I think there were some civil servants that actually um, went to bed not happy because I don't think they thought about it, to be quite honest. I really don't think they thought about it. I spoke with a colleague of mine at um, a, a big firm of accountants and I said, you know, what about the interaction between the reclaim of employers' national insurance and the reclaim of, of, of the employment allowance? What do you think the HMRC are going to do? He said, my gut feeling is they're going to ignore it. I don't know. And I, I, I truly don't know. It hasn't, I, it hasn't been thought about. I don't think it's been thought about. I don't think it's been thought about. But it's a really good question. Really good question. Great. More um, questions than answers, unfortunately. Maybe we can move on to holidays. Um, uh. so, so this is a good one. So Maggie says that she knows an employee that has been asked to take holiday uh, entitlement rather than be furloughed. The employer is in a position to impose holidays on the uh, employee, that's, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, as long as they give the required amount of notice. So um, I think if, if they're requiring you to take five days holiday, they've got to give you 10 days notice. I think that's the, the, the way it is. But yes, an employer could, could do that. Yeah, if they wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. So, Can so they force you to take all 28 days or does it have to be what would normally be regarded as say one week in the first quarter two weeks in the middle half and then one week in the, in the final quarter or can they just I mean nobody's gonna have any holidays if they're not careful at the end of that period well that's, and, that's the that's the only thing isn't it that's the yeah. only thing uh, so we say this is over in September the employees all come back from from furlough and none of them, them have got any leave and you know uh, the planes are flying again and, and no one's got any leave so there's a lot of un unpaid leave but the employer could say we are shutting down um, just like Ford's used to do in, in, in Dagenham and um, Factory and, Week, yeah. Here and Factory companies door. do at Christmas and all that kind of thing. Yes, could do. We're shutting down. You are required to take holiday, but they've got to give notice to their employees. But the, the, the employer can impose it. Yes. Hmm. Sue wonders how do you go about calculating holiday? Uh, for staff who were on zero hours contracts and whose hours varied month to month if they're accruing their holiday pay. Now, see, that's separate from furloughing, isn't it? That's a sort of like a normal payroll question, isn't it? A normal payroll question. Um, it is. Um, where's the guidance? Where's the guidance? Where's the guidance? Um, Which is just because cause we do know that you, you do accrue annual leave holiday entitlement don't you yes. while you're on furlough yeah so yeah so what how much annual leave do you get if you're on a zero as contract yeah um where is a good place to go for guidance the, um uh, the department for business energy and industrial strategy published some guidance in march 2020 that would be somewhere i'd point you to 
Um, okay. On we'll gov.uk, there's a calculator as well. Calculate your holiday entitlement. Um, but yeah, have a look at the Bayes guidance and see if that see if that answers the question. If not, put it on your questions log and we'll 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 find out. Okay. Uh, Ian, the other thing is, if if people are furloughed, we're told that uh, if that isn't part of their holiday, so therefore the holidays are being constantly accrued, um, and um, this means obviously that. Well, let's say it does continue until September because there is a lot of conjectures to when this will finish. But if yes, it goes till yes. September, by the end of September, some people will have three or four weeks. Now, we're told they can hold that over, roll it over, uh, because the, the company's actually can change or employment laws will change so it can roll over for up to two years. But um, that could, could cause quite a problem for an employer who's trying to get the business back up and running and suddenly finds everybody wants a holiday. Um, yeah, no, has absolutely. that been thought about or is that it? Yeah, no, absolutely, which is one of the reasons why they extended, because the leave, the Euro leave, the 20 days, was either use it in this year or lose it. Um, yeah. But that was one of the reasons, uh, say things are back together in, uh, in September, employers didn't want to be flooded with a load of employees saying, oh, I can go to Mexico now, I'm going to meet your cry, I always wanted to go to Tenerife, and it was because the planes are starting going. So then they, rather than just use it or lose it, you have to use it, or you lose it if you haven't taken it within two years. It's hopefully to spread the risk. Now they've introduced that two years. If things are really bad, I don't see any reason, given these regulations, they allow for that two years to be extended. Mm. So possibly okay. that will happen. Possibly that will happen. But let's hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah, okay. How are we doing, Amy? Because I should imagine Ian will be drying up shortly. Uh um, we've got so many, well, we've had 170 some odd questions. Really? I'll try to group Good. them together. I think I've answered a few. <laughs> uh, should we go through a couple more? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so, taking people on and off furlough, um, Vicky um, from Starbucks is wondering if it's acceptable to rotate furloughed workers after the three week minimum period. Um, in order to plan around a reduced company workload? And is there a minimum period to observe between furloughed periods? No, no you can, and, and I've spoken to a number of departments, for example, sales departments, and employers are saying to me, there's no good time in the sales department because nobody's buying, so what's the point of selling? But we've got five people in the department, so we want to furlough one person for three weeks, um, then they become an employee again, and then we furlough somebody else. Rotational furloughing within the same department, absolutely fine as long as for the reclaim the minimum furloughing period is three weeks but yeah rotational furloughing is fine and no gap in between fantastic is there what do you say about people who furloughed their employees and then bring them on as freelancers Ooh. what <laughs> oh bring the, the individual so the furloughed employee is then brought on as a freelancer Mm, for like ad hoc work, a day or two here and there. I think that's a fiddle. But <laughs> you, the reason you're fur furloughing them is because you don't want them to do any work under their contract of employment. So why? why, why no, I think it's. I think. I think that's that horrible. Doesn't, that doesn't sound right. No, I, um, I don't know. that no. comes under fiddle. Okay, so but essentially, what you do, you reinstate them. For you could reinstate them for two days, you say, and then refurlough them again. Yeah, if you furlough them for for uh, three weeks, and then the employer says, "Yeah, well, I've got a couple of days' work," then you bring them back as an employee for a couple of days, and then you refurlough them. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. so fun in the payroll, isn't it? Oh no, it's, I think it's going to be absolutely horrible, absolutely oh. horrible. I really do. I really do. And employers are, are going to be doing all sorts of different things, depending on, you know, retail is going to be doing one thing, construction is going to be doing another thing. It's, it, it, I think it's going to be a real challenge, but I think it's really exciting. <laughs> Anything like this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, I keep saying to our members, this, this is how you make yourself not only relevant, but absolute necessity going forward it's for at least true. the next 12 months. It's great. 
That's and, right. Uh, and to be enough. included on the list of key workers, you know, if it comes from Boris Johnson to bid for finance and payroll to be on the list of key workers, I mean, that's showing how we're regarded, isn't it? And, and I think keeping people paid will be appreciated. After this is over, and hopefully it won't last long, people will appreciate the work that payroll departments, bookkeepers, agents, tax advisors have done keeping them paid. I really do. And hopefully the government will as well. And um, where, where did you, I know the CIPP has come up with that, but we've had that denied. They say, no, it is payment. That's nothing to do with pay. It's people like banks, building societies, etc. cetera. Um, because the thing is, of course, if you are a, a, a one of those professionals, that means that your children can go to school. Absolutely. And that is what they're saying. So if one of our bookkeepers is doing payroll, they automatically become an essential worker because yeah. they have to go in to do payroll. Yeah. And the advice we got was, no, that's not what it means. And if you do it, you may be called into account. If you spread the virus, it's a criminal act. No, I spoke to the Department for Education because I queried what um, this institute, and I spoke to the Department for Education, and after speaking to one person and the manager, yes, they confirmed that payroll was an essential um, occupation and we would be regarded as key workers. So if, if the worst came to the worst, you know, and we had to go in and pay, well, we could, if we could find a school that was open, send our children to school. Wow. Right. And it's been wow. advertised in a number of places. But I think, you know, apart from this sending, uh, sending kids to, to, to school business, the fact that we've got that um, uh, kudos of being sort of like regarded as absolutely important in keeping the country going. Because let's face it, if it wasn't for bookkeepers and accountants and agents and all that kind of thing, all these people, the National Health Service, we wouldn't get paid. Now, I, I mean, I don't know how many months I'd work without getting paid. Possibly one. Um... Uh, so we are absolute, absolutely essential. Mm, that's well, interesting. That, uh, not, the the questions are just going up and up and up, aren't they? <laughs> they are a little. I just wonder, I think that brings us on nicely to just people asking about whether, what sort of work you can do, whether you're furloughed. And obviously people are saying, can you, can somebody just do the payroll or just do, you know, the finances if it's not, um, you know, generating income? No, the, the, the payroll administrator, if they're furloughed, in their job description, it says you are employed to do the payroll. That's mm. a little bit fancier than that. So if they're <laughs> furloughed, the, the whole point of being furloughed is they can't perform any work that they would normally perform under their contract of employment. Now, if the cleaner was furloughed and came in and did the payroll, now that might be a different kettle of fish because they're coming in to do something that's not under their contract of employment. So under the guidance, you, under what you've just said, then does that mean that you can be furloughed for three weeks and come in for a week to do the payroll, then another three weeks, then come in and do the payroll? Absolutely, absolutely, and I should think that will happen. Yeah, what I heard uh, recently from somebody I used to work with, um, uh, somebody, and this might be an be an avenue for bookkeepers in the in the future. Um, is she uh, contacted me through through LinkedIn and she said, bit a bit of a situation. Our company's just furloughed everybody, including the people that do the payroll. She said, how do we do the payroll? And I said, oh, that's a bit of an no. interesting one. I hadn't even thought about it before, but silly company, to be quite honest. But yeah, furlough for three weeks, bring him in for a week to do the payroll, furlough for another three weeks, bring him in, in, in for a week to do the payroll. Yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And just on that, is the, the three week minimum, does that mean there's, you have to furlough in blocks of three or can you furlough someone for four weeks? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just got to be a minimum of three. So you can four, five, six, seven. Yeah, it doesn't have to be in blocks of three, but a minimum of three. Okay. Um, and can you really, says. Vicky and Jane, lots of people were wondering, can you reclaim every month to coincide with the monthly payroll? Or do you have every to Every three weeks you can reclaim. Every okay. three weeks, which is going to be a nuisance for payrolls that often run monthly. Um, so employers they're going to want the money understandably your rose and crown and dog and duck and what they're going to want the money but and they're going to be asking for figures every three weeks and so what are we actually going to be saying to them well we haven't done your monthly payroll yet so you give provisional figures i think hmrc are going to be happy with provisional figures to be quite honest but we've got to have mm -hmm. our sort of like mindsets and our system set up to be able to provide these provisional figures and justify the figures that we're giving but no that's that's what it will be every three weeks which is a bit 
crazy, I think. But we think potentially well, you could just claim it every month. You could just claim it every month. Yeah, so run your monthly payroll and um, stick, your, stick your claim in. Yeah, you could do. And government has said that this money will come back very swiftly. once. Very they quickly, they've right. said. Yeah, that's right. And I think initially um, HMRC will get the claim in. I hope there's nobody from HMRC on the line. Uh, HMRC will get the, get the claim in. I say, oh yeah, this, this ticks all the boxes. They've given an amount, they've given a telephone number, they've given their bank details. Yes, it's a UK bank account. And they will just pay the money. The compliance will come afterwards. So it's pay first, keep employees on, reimburse your employers, and then there'll be some compliance. There's just got to, there, you know, HMRC and the UK government are just not gonna give away billions and billions of pounds without there being some sort of compliance activity. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder then if we, we're not, I don't think we're doing too bad on the questions actually, but I was thinking maybe just to kind of finish us off um, about this sort of practicality, <laughs> finish us off completely, the practicalities of actually running the payroll. Bron has said, um, I'm doing the monthly payroll. Their employees were working from the 1st to the 18th of March and from the 19th of March, they were furloughed. I have pro rated the salary on a daily basis and calculated 80% on the furloughed salary only. Is that correct? And people are asking for just clarification that they run, do they run the 80% of the salary or do they run it as full salary with the deductions? You can do it either way. Honestly, you can do it how you like. You can really do it how you like. As long as you, as the payroll administrator, the bookkeeper, the agent, can justify what you've done and it's in accordance with what the client wants. You can do it how you, absolutely how you like. And another consideration of um, paying full salary and then making a deduction, or even sort of like paying 18 days at one rate and, 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 and the rest at another rate, is that that's got to be communicated to the employee as well. Because the last thing we want with, with these employees that are in, in an understandably frustrated position anyway, we don't want the load of telephone calls saying, well, how's my pay slip calculated? You know, so I, I would say be, be clear, um, I, I, as clear as possible. So yeah, pro rata in a month seems to be a really good, really good idea. I'd, if, if I was in live pay right now, I wonder if I'd pro rata on one pay element and the other pro rata on another pay element. At least that's quite clear. This is your salary. This is your furloughed salary. I wonder if I'd have done it like that. But it's all come about sort of like within the last few days. You know, payroll departments have had to do something. And I, would, I would think, I was just going to say, I would think probably quite a lot of the software companies will have a sort of how-to by this point to say... Your Epcom? How to do it, maybe? <laughs> a little box well, you just tick and it goes furloughed? No. no? I mean, they don't just make up their mind, do they? I mean, the thing is, um, Ian... Uh, can actually change his mind whilst he's talking to us and it can be done he can do it differently the software company's got to program it in and make everything else click in place and they've just done it and the next piece of legislation comes out or even thought comes out and, and everything changes they have to start again so yeah. um, I know they're all saying lots of great things um, but I think they are admitting that they're playing catch up so I think there's going to be a lot of um, well how can I Bookkeeping ingenuity taking place to get it working right at the moment, and, and I think I think that's absolutely. great. Absolutely, it's just and, justifying what you've done. Is it fair what you've done? Is it in the spirit of the scheme what you've done? Um, um, can you justify it to the employer? Can you provide the figures to the employer? Can you provide the information to the employee? Because as I said, you you just do not want a load of emails and telephone conversations with employees. Um, so it's just doing the very best you can. As regards software, I know that I've talked to the company that I'm working for and I said, well, we could do this, we could do that. And they're saying, well, we don't really know what the guidance is gonna be. And um, there are a number of little flags that we could have used in payroll software, we could have been changed at the last minute, but what HMRC have, have taken on board thankfully, is, is us pestering them year after year after year saying, you can't just impose something on software developers because we're not magicians, we just can't do it. You've got to give us six months lead in time at least because it's not only understanding what you've written, it's interpreting what you've written, testing what we've written, testing it again, and then releasing it to clients. We just can't do something magically. So 
all of this is going to be done outside of the payroll, the reclaim and everything. So it's inventiveness time for payroll administrators. And I think the other thing is that something that um, it's finally justified the fact that we as ICB doing it during our exams still expect people to do something without software. They have to be able to think, they have to be Absolutely. able to understand. Absolutely. And unfortunately, a lot of people come out with a certificate which says they know how to use a piece of software. It won't be worth the paper it's written on at the moment because... Uh, you know, some people, if, if that's what they're relying on, will just not get paid this, this month. And Absolutely. that's got to be the biggest problem out. So, um, you know, yeah, all of the years that Jackie to... Mountain has been saying we've got to have it, we've got to have all this manual stuff, then uh, she's been totally justified in everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Because when I used to do training for an organization, um, uh, they were saying, well, why do we need to calculate tax manually and SSP manually? We just press the button. I said, oh, yeah, but you'd like to check. Well, I, I mean, I always like to check what's coming out of the computer system. Now I've been proved right. You've been proved yep. right. We do need to be able to do it. We do need to be able to calculate a day's pay. And the number of people that can't calculate SSP, um, three days, they can't calculate SSP. And we're having to tell them um, how to do it. It's, it's amazing. So what you're doing is absolutely admirable. What other organizations are doing is admirable. Manual calculation is absolutely essential. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, look, Ian, I think if we can finish on that, there are a lot of questions. We, we, we'll send some off. You, you might like to pick and choose the, the, the beefy ones and, and have a go at that. Otherwise, what the we easy do... easy ones, did you say? Or the beefy <laughs> ones? <laughs> the beefy ones, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any easy ones. I mean, the <laughs> thing about bookkeepers is we have such a broad spectrum of clients. They're everything from one man, one woman bands up to, um, you know, sort of 200 employees or something or other. That tends to be the area. But it doesn't seem to be a, any commonality between them. It's not just payroll that we have this with. So... But it that's what makes a bookkeeper's job interesting, to be honest. Absolutely. You know, and it you makes don't me want to see be things from a different angle. I, I've noticed that you've been uh, thinking about these things that, that you've not come across before, and that obviously mm. makes your job exciting as well. So yeah. that's good. As exciting as it can get. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, we have to take what we can in these times of exactly. uh, lockdown exactly. and uh, seeing everybody on screen. So, yeah, thank you very much for that on behalf of everybody. Oh, um, you're more than welcome. Thank you. And can I just make a few things, uh, just say a few things before uh, before we close? And that is that I understand um, that the Chancellor is going to make another statement tomorrow about the self-employed. Nobody's quite sure what this is, but several people have suggested it's additional help, possibly for those who are earning more than 50000 a year, or possibly some sort of additional prop up. We're not sure. So look out for that. We will be on air tomorrow. So um, I think it might well be made after we finish, so uh, we'll cover it on, on our programme on Monday. But a whole week <laughs> running next week. Just to let you know, tomorrow, a couple of interesting things. We've got one of our own uh, fellows, that Jane James. She's coming on to talk to us. Now, Jane's got a practice, and those of you who will have seen any of our early, I think probably our first promotional video, Jane James was one of our members on at that time. She'd just got her practice license. Um, she had a young baby uh, and that baby is now grown up and you know, I think 20s, in the 20s. Um, and she was talking about working from home and she's progressed quite a lot. She's got a good practice there now. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, she is actually working for the local council now. She um, works for, uh, I've got a note here somewhere. She works for Breckland District Council. She's a local councillor, uh, a district and town councillor, and she's part of the executive support team. And so she's going to be talking to us about some of the moves that the council are making to keep up with this and being able to look at it the other way by being a bookkeeper, having to work with clients that are trying to get grants and government, etc. Um, obviously, because she's working for the council, she's our very own PEP. Those of you who know what a PEP is, um, a politically exposed person. So I suppose in these times of grant, we need to make sure that she isn't allowing her clients to get more grants than all the rest of them, etc. cetera. Uh, and we've got a two-headed tomorrow in as much as we've also got uh, Nick Good coming along. Now, some of you who came to the early seminar, uh, early summits, I know there are hundreds of you, um, might remember Nick Good as being the person who came and talked to us about SAGE. And he recently left SAGE. He now has gone as Vice Principal of Growth for Revolut, the new 
Challenger Bank, so that's Revolut Business. They formed a special business section. And he's going to talk to us about what's happening in the banking industry and how this will uh, affect you as a bookkeeper and some opportunities as a bookkeeper for you to say to your clients, well, look, you don't have to stick with the old Matt West and um, Lloyds, Barclays or whatever it is, HSBC. There are now some alternatives. And I know uh, from our conversations last year at Summit, some of you are already using Challenger Banks, Tide and Starling Bank, etc. Um, but he's coming on to take talk to you about this and you know how secure are these banks uh, in times of difficulty like this is this the wrong time to change or actually could it be the right time to change to a different bank are they secure do they are they able to provide you with the government loans uh, the business loans that are being offered at the moment the continuation loans all those sorts of things we discussed tomorrow so i'm hoping um, a great number of you will join us again tomorrow uh, three o'clock again and we're going to do that throughout next week and we'll over the days promote what's going on we're just lining people up at the moment thank you very much amy for steering us and keeping all the questions honed in uh, amy will be responsible for making sure everything goes up on the web don't forget icb website hit the resources button then covid everything that uh, ian has been referring to by way of legislation is covered in there somewhere there's lots of links if you didn't manage to take them down that is being added to daily read the latest stuff first because uh, again as Ian already said things are changing rapidly so what we wrote <laughs> yesterday will be um, superseded by uh, what we're what we're writing again today but uh, meanwhile you're coming on in your absolute hundreds I mean 190 questions I mean uh, we, we by the time you've done the downloads on, on the Facebook uh, more than a thousand of you uh, um, in fact, one, two, I think, on, on one particular uh, have been uh, involved. So it proves that you, you want the, the contact. And uh, I, go, I remember when my estate agent said, uh, um, location, location, location. Uh, well, my motto at the moment is um, communication, communication, communication. So the more that we can do to help you through this area, help you through this current state of play, um, we don't always know the answers, as um, Ian has been uh, very uh, kind to say today, that he doesn't always know the answers, neither do we. But actually, between us, I think we should come up with a decent consensus and we can all move through this because when we get out of this, whether that's June, July, August, September, or even next year, there is going to be a, a, an absolutely exponential growth needed to get us back on our feet as a country and we as bookkeepers have got to be a major part of that we've got a great role to play and uh, so uh, we need to get going so thank you very much everybody and hopefully see you tomorrow thank you Ian. thank you amy Good afternoon